The Pharisees certainly did not think that the Son of God was beyond reproach. Following Jesus' feeding of the 4,000, they came testing Him, asking Him to show them a sign from heaven. In Matthew 19, the Pharisees also came to Him, testing Him. And then again, the Pharisees sought to entangle Him in His talk in Matthew 22. The jealous and hypocritical Pharisees were so relentless in their efforts to destroy the Lord's influence that on one occasion in Matthew chapter 12, they even accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the law as they went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, were hungry, and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. The microscopic scrutiny under which Jesus lived likely was even more relentless than what some world-famous individuals experience today. In, in one sense, the Pharisees could be considered the paparazzi of Jesus' day. Allegedly, what the disciples were doing on this particular Sabbath, there in Matthew 12, was considered work which the law of Moses prohibited. Jesus responded to the criticism of the Pharisees by giving the truth of the matter and at the same time revealing the Pharisees' hypocrisy. As was somewhat customary for Jesus when being tested by his enemies, he responded to the Pharisees' accusation with questions. Two questions. First, he asked, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Jesus reminded the Pharisees of an event in the life of David recorded in 1 Samuel 21, where he and others, while fleeing from King Saul, ate of the showbread which divine law restricted to the priest. Some have unjustifiably concluded that Jesus was implying innocence on the part of David and that God's laws are subservient to human needs, and thus supposedly Jesus was defending his disciples' lawless actions with the same kind of reasoning. Actually, however, just the opposite is true. Jesus explicitly stated that what David did was wrong. It was not lawful. And that what Jesus' disciples did was right. They were guiltless, as we read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. Furthermore, as J.W. McGarvey observed, if Christians may violate law when its observance would involve hardship or suffering, then there is an end to suffering for the name of Christ and an end even of self-denial. The disciples were not permitted by Jesus to break the law on this occasion or on any other just because it was inconvenient. The Pharisees simply were wrong in their accusations. The only law Jesus' disciples broke was the Pharisaical interpretation of the law, which seems to have been more sacred to the Pharisees than the law itself. In response to such hyper-legalism, commentator Burton Kaufman forcefully stated, In the Pharisees' view, the disciples were guilty of threshing wheat. Such pedantry, nitpicking, and magnification of trifles would also have made them guilty of irrigating land if they had chanced to knock off a few drops of dew while passing through the fields. The Pharisees were out to get Jesus, and any charge was better than none. Jesus used the instruction of 1 Samuel 21 to cause the Pharisees to recognize their insincerity and to justify his disciples. David, a man about whom the Jews ever boasted, blatantly violated God's law by eating the showbread, as well as lying to the priest there in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 2, and yet the Pharisees seemed to justify him. On the other hand, Jesus' disciples merely plucked some grain on the Sabbath while walking through a field from one place to another, an act that the law did not forbid, yet the Pharisees condemned them. Had the Pharisees not approved of David's conduct, they could have just responded by saying, You judge yourself. You're all sinners. Their reaction to Jesus' question, that of silence, was that of hypocrites who had been exposed. Jesus then asked a second question, saying, Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Here, Jesus wanted the Pharisees to acknowledge that even the law itself condoned some work on the Sabbath day. Although the Pharisees acted as if 
all work was banned on this day, it was actually the busiest day of the week for priests. As McGarvey explained, they baked and changed the showbread, they performed sabbatical sacrifices, and two lambs were killed on the Sabbath in addition to the daily sacrifice. This involved the killing, skinning, and cleaning of the animals, and the building of the fire to consume the sacrifice. They also trimmed the gold lamps, burned incense, and performed various other duties. One of those other duties would have been to circumcise young baby boys when the child's eighth day fell on a Sabbath. The purpose of Jesus citing these profane priestly works was to prove that the Sabbath prohibition was not unconditional. Jesus used the term profane not because there was a real desecration of the temple by the priest as they worked, but as E.W. Bullinger explained, to express what was true according to the mistaken notions of the Pharisees as to manual works performed on the Sabbath. The truth is, the Sabbath law did not forbid work absolutely, but labor for worldly gain. Activity in the work of God was both allowed and commanded. Just as the priests who served God in the temple on the Sabbath were totally within the law, so likewise were Jesus' disciples as they served the Lord of the Sabbath, whose holiness was even greater than that of the temple.